Okay, atomic spectroscopy. Um, this is uh, very related to what we're doing in lab this, today. Um, when atoms or molecules absorb energy, they release that energy as, as light, frequently, but um, they don't always do this, but there's, a, there's words missing from my sentence. Um, or maybe there's an extra comma. I don't know. Um, examples of this are fireworks, neon lights. So this is a, a photograph of a neon light. And that actually contains the element neon. Neon gas, when you zap it with electricity, gives off that very, very bright orange color. Um, and that is characteristic of neon. If you make a similar lamp or light out of, um, with a different element in it, um, you see mercury uh, glows with more of a, a pale blue. Helium is, is violet. Um, and hydrogen doesn't look like hydrogen, but whatever. Um, each element emits a characteristic color. When you take the light from an element lamp like that and pass it through a prism, you see a pattern of, of different colors. When we do this with, with white light, light from the sun, we see a continuous rainbow. If you pass the light from one of these lamps through a prism, you do not see a continuous rainbow, although the colors are separated in the same way. But what you see are specific lines and a lot of darkness in between. And those, the series of lines is almost like a barcode on something you might buy at the store. It's characteristic of that element. Um, you can use it to, to identify the element. And this pattern that we observe cannot be explained by classical physics. So this is the sort of pattern I'm talking about. Um, here's a helium spectrum. White light from the sun would give us a rainbow, like this one down, down here. Pointer won't go. Um, helium is going to give us just several lines of color. Barium gives more lines. Um, so we see that the colors are lining up between the helium and the barium spectrum. They're lining up in the same places, roughly. You know, the yellow is here because the prism separates the wavelengths the same way. But the helium is missing some of the colors that the barium spectrum has. So we take the, the lamp, the light from the lamp, pass it through a slit to focus it, and run it through a prism separates into a rainbow, except most of the colors are missing. Any questions? You can look at the absorbance or the emission of light. Um, so this would be um, an emission spectrum for, for mercury, where you're looking at the light that's emitted. You can also look at the light that is absorbed. Um, it absorbs in the same place that it emits. So here we see dark lines um, where color is missing, and here we see bright lines. The, the rainbow in the back is just from background light. That's not from the mercury lamp. So we can see this in, a, in one of those lamps, which is a partially evacuated tube that has that element in it. And then you put it in a, a holder that applies a voltage across it, and the, it glows. It's a lot like a, a fluorescent lamp. Or you can take the element and stick it in a flame, and the flame will change color. So when we put sodium in a flame, we get a very bright orangey-yellow color. Um, and what's happening here is the heat from the burner flame is giving energy to the atoms. And they absorb the energy, and then they release it in the form of light. And so the color that we observe is a combination of all the different colors in the spectrum for that element. Potassium gives us a lavender flame. Lithium is bright red, and barium has kind of a greenish color. They used to sell these. Um, stuff you could put in your fireplace that would make the flames different colors. It was just different metals. 
And it's the same thing that's going on with the fireworks. How do they make the, the fireworks different colors? It's different elements. So Johannes Rydberg um, was looking at these atomic spectra and trying to figure out what the relationship was between the lines, etc. And so he came up with an equation which explains, well, it doesn't explain. It describes the lines and quantifies them, but it doesn't explain why they are like that. So his equation is here. Uh, 1 over lambda equals r times the quantity 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared. So lambda is the wavelength of the line. r is a constant, and m and n are integers. And so he found that you could describe the relationship of these lines based on a couple of integers. So now let's try to explain why this is happening. So Rutherford's mo nuclear model of the atom, um, we've talked about this. The atom has a tiny dense center called the nucleus, and that's where almost all the mass is. The protons and the neutrons are in there. The nucleus is positively charged. Uh, the amount of positive charge balances the negative charge of the electrons. So the number of protons and electrons are equal so that the uh, atom has a neutral charge. And then the electrons are moving around in the empty space of the atom surrounding the nucleus. So electrons are moving charged particles, according to Rutherford's model. And according to classical physics, moving charged particles give off energy. If these electrons are giving off energy, then they should be probably causing the atom to glow all by itself, which we know that doesn't happen. And if they're giving off energy, they're losing energy, then eventually they're going to run out of energy and crash into the nucleus, and the atom should collapse. But it doesn't. So the nuclear model doesn't explain what's going on when the atom gains or loses energy, as it does in these element lamps where we zap it with electricity, and then we see the energy being re-released as light. Rutherford's model doesn't explain that. So Niels Bohr developed a model to explain what changes are happening when energy transitions occur. So in Bohr's model, we've got electrons traveling around the nucleus in circular orbits much like the solar system, where the sun would be the nucleus and the planets would be electrons. And the electrons are traveling around in predictable, nice Newtonian type orbits. The orbits exist only at specific fixed distances from the nucleus. And so the energy of each orbit is also fixed. We say it's quantized. The amount of energy in the atom is related to the electron's position in the atom. Quantized means that you only have specific levels. I can't remember. So quantized. Um, there are a lot of things in everyday life that are quantized. Stairs are quantized elevation. So if you think about going up a set of stairs, and you start at the bottom and you go up. You can be on this step or you can be on that step. You can't stand in between, right? A ladder is, is similar. It kind of looks like a fruit picking ladder. Let's put a pole on it. Um, you can stand on one rung or the other rung. You can't stand in between. If you have a ramp, you could be anywhere along the ramp. And so your distance above the ground is, is infinitely variable. You could be anywhere. And so it's a continuous, um, a continuous slope here, whereas a ladder or stairs are quantized. There are specific levels. So here's an illustration of, of Bohr's model. There's the nucleus 
here's one orbit, two orbits, three orbits, and they're numbered, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And so he explained the spectrum of hydrogen in this way. He said, well, you know, we got the one electron here. When the atom absorbs energy, it's the electron that gets that energy, and it's going to jump up to a higher orbit, a higher energy orbit. So you zap it with electricity, lots of energy, maybe the electron goes up to orbit 5. Well, it's not stable. That energy is going to come back out, and so that will come back out when the electron drops down to a lower orbit, a lower energy level. The energy of the light that comes out is equal to the difference in energy between those two levels. And so here we've got violet light that's higher in energy, and so it's got a big, big difference here. If it was at level four and drops down to level two, then we get this blue-green light. It's lower in energy. The difference in energy between level four and level two is smaller. And if it goes from level three to level two, we see a red light, which is yet lower in energy. <coughs> So the color of the light tells us the energy difference between the orbitals, I'm sorry, the orbits that the electron is, is moving between. The radiation, the light that comes out is a photon of light, um, a, a packet of light. Remember, light can behave as a particle and or as a wave. Any questions? Yes. That's a good question. Is 5 the highest level? No, it's not. There are higher levels. The reason that we're showing you 5 to 2, 4 to 2, and 3 to 2 is those are the three transitions where the energy falls in the visible spectrum. And so that's what gives us visible light lines. There are other transitions, but like going from 2 to 1, that is so low in energy that it's below the red color of visible light, and so we don't see that. Did you have a question? Uh, kind of so five to three, um, that transition would be, it, it doesn't correspond, it doesn't fall within visible light. So these are the three lines of hydrogen that are within the visible region. The other transitions are all going to be either too high in energy or too low in energy. So the electron can move from one orbit to the other. What's a little hard to grasp, because we, we think of electrons as being particles, and so, OK, the planet is going from this orbit to that orbit. But at some point, it has to be between while it's transitioning, right? When you go up the stairs, you are in motion, but you are going from one level to the next, one step to the next, right? Electrons don't do that. They are never, ever observed between states. They are in one state or in another state. In orbit two or orbit three, they don't go in between, and that's kind of hard get your mind around. That's called a quantum leap. There's a very old TV show called Quantum Leap where this guy would, you know, he'd be in one place and then he'd be in another place, right? Really great way to travel, unfortunately, and, you know, it's not yet possible. The energy of the photon that's given off is equal to the energy difference between those two states. Um, so we can look at the energy of the light emitted and we can use Rydberg's equation and figure out what the different levels are and what their energies are based on the spectral lines. So the Bohr model was really awesome. Um, and it still has great historical and conceptual importance. Um, and it is a convenient way to think about the atom but unfortunately, it's not correct. The Bohr model only works for hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron. It's the simplest, smallest atom element. 
if you get more than one electron, the Bohr model doesn't work anymore. So obviously something is, is missing. So the Bohr model was replaced with the quantum mechanical model.